call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of May 8th, 2024. Um, two brief agenda items today, relatively brief. We have an update on the um, affordability standards uh, that Mike Barber has been working on with our team. And then we have a revised budget staff presentation from about one care from our staff. Um, Michelle Sawyer will lead that. Um, I'll turn to Susan Barrett for executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to alert folks to keep an eye on our monthly calendar. Uh, the month of May is turning out to be a very, very busy month for the Green Mountain Care Board. So we've added um, recently some additional presentations. Um, and just to highlight uh, next week, May 15th, the board will be hearing a panel discussion from Vermont's um, providers on Vermont's global budget design and the AHEAD model. In addition, on um, that evening, uh, this is not new to the agenda, we have a primary care advisory group meeting that starts at 5.30 p.m. And then also uh, on our agenda for the month of May is on Monday, May 20th at 9 a.m. We have a CON hearing for the UVMMC Outpatient Surgery Center. And then lastly, on Wednesday, May 22nd, we have another panel discussion uh, with a national perspective of um, value-based care. So please just check that out on our website so you can, so especially for the public, you can keep uh, informed on our very busy schedule for May. And then in terms of public comments, we currently have the V Cures reporting manual, the updates to that out for public comment. We wanna hear from folks by May 31st. And then the two ongoing public comment periods are one, the Act 167 hospital sustainability work. Please share any comments regarding that. And then, uh, any comments regarding the AHEAD model. Again, we share any of the comments we receive with the Agency of Human Services as they are leading the work on this next potential model. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We have meeting minutes from um, just this Monday, May 6th. I'll move for approval of the minutes from May 6th. I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And the minutes are approved. Um, I'll turn it to Mike Barber, our general counsel. Hi, good afternoon. I'm back with you today to discuss the possibility of adopting formal guidance regarding consideration of affordability in the board's rate review process. <clears throat> and just to refresh everyone's recollection, um, the Green Mountain Care Board staff worked closely with folks from Baylet Health and the Center on Health Insurance Reforms to develop a draft guidance document on this topic. We shared that draft with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, MVP, the Healthcare Advocate, Department of Financial Regulation, and the Department of Vermont Health Access, and we sought their feedback. Uh, in general, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate was supportive of the direction and approach reflected in the initial draft, but raised uh, several technical issues and questions to work through. The other commenters um, expressed opposition and concern in addition to raising technical issues and trying to find a way to make what I felt was progress on this issue. I took a stab at alternative or revised guidance, which I presented last week, and that alternative version drew some uh, pretty strong objections from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, as well as uh, it sounded like opposition from Blue Cross. So I'm back here today to get some direction from you as to how you want to proceed. Um, 
I don't have slides, but you know, it, it seems to me that there are three potential options, although there could be more that I'm not seeing. Um, so first, you could vote on the initial guidance. Second, you could vote on the alternative or revised guidance. And third, you could uh, direct me or somebody to work through the issues uh, with the initial draft guidance. Um, kind of take take those up uh, after the QHP rate review process is over and come back to you at a later date. Um, regarding that third option, I you know I believe Eric said this last week that the issues they raised with the initial draft are not insurmountable. I, my sense is that is accurate, um, that we may not be able to address all the issues they raised, but I suspect we can address the ones that need to be addressed to do a reasonably accurate comparison of premiums and deductibles to the ACA and HHIS standards that we had identified. So, um, that's all I've got for you, but I'm happy to hear your thoughts and I'm happy to try and answer any questions you might have. Any board member thoughts on Mike's options? Sorry, could you sure. share that last point? Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Dave. Yes, just the, the last point you said, you, you do think it's possible to come up with a reasonable is my audio bad still? All right. Um, you do think it's possible to come up with a reasonable analysis of premium and deductions? Is that what you said? Sorry. Um, deductibles, yeah. Deductibles, thanks. Did you think that was possible to come up with a reasonable analysis of both of them oh, with this guidance? Sorry, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I think, you know, we're largely. Yes, I do. I'll leave it at that. And then, and you previously described the two different types of deductibles and one was more complicated than the other. But do you think it's that there's a reasonable methodology to deal with both types of deductibles? Uh, so I'm not an expert on this. Uh, my understanding is there's like four types of deductibles. <laughs> so there's there's an integrated deductible, which is combining the medical and pharmacy deductibles, and then there's non-integrated or separate deductibles. So you have a, a medical deductible and a pharmacy deductible. The healthcare advocate, I think, suggested, you know, combining those two separate deductibles and comparing that to the 5% threshold. That seems to make some sense. I, we can work through any objections to that. The, the trickier issue is the uh, stacked deductibles. I assume that there is a, an approach we can take, whether it's just looking at the family deductible or, or something else. I, I assume we can. I don't see that. I don't. I, I, I imagine we can get 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 through that. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, Jess. Oh no, I was just going to say um, that I really appreciated the effort to address affordability. I know you put some work into this, Mike, and I appreciated all the commentary and the dialogue last week. Um, I thought it was really enlightening, and and I would support option three. I think there's more work to be done on this, but I I like the the direction it's going, and with more input, I think could be really helpful to the board in the future. So I was just going to say appreciate everybody's efforts, the continued dialogue, and I would support option three. <clears throat> Thanks, <clears throat> Mike. I also wanted to. Um, well, I wasn't here last week, so I did watch um, the recording of the meeting, and I thought that it was uh, a very helpful discussion. And I think that it's. Um, I wanted to thank you and and staff for all the work you did um, to bring this issue to the fore. I think it's a crucial thing for us as a board. Um, it's in our uh, statute that we should be assessing affordability. Uh, we've had no assessment, no formal assessment of it, no measure of it in the past. So I think it's a very important step. Um, other states are doing it. Um, in your review of the literature, you brought forward some of their methods. Um, 
there were there were comments last week about um, some controversy about whether to assess affordability or not for fear of the board assessing it and reporting something as affordable while families and Vermonters may still feel that it's unaffordable. Um, at first, I, I, well, I listened to that and I, I reflected on it quite a bit. Um, I ended up not agreeing with, with that. I still think we need to push forward with a measure and, an, and um, those labels uh, because we're charged with assessing affordability. And if we're not assessing it, but we're still um, passing rate increases, that alone suggests that we are finding them affordable. So we need a measure. It would be just one measure that we're looking at um, of all the other things that we're trying to consider. So I, all of this is to say, I think this is a very important topic. I think the concerns raised from public comments were, were excellent. Um, I can continually learn from our um, public commenters. Um, and I, I think if we give this some more time, we could move from reviewing literature to actually meeting with subject matter experts who have implemented measures. So instead of just learning about their conceptual thinking and how they outline what it could do, let's talk to some people who have actually um, implemented measures in the next year. I'm comfortable with option three. Um, so I'm happy to hear the results of the further work when they're available. I think we should take advantage of op option three as well. Um, so thank you for suggesting it, Mike, and to the hospitals and insurance companies and HCA that are willing to help us and work with us on that. Um, Mike, I, I don't think we need a vote on anything such as that, so um, I will turn to public comment via the raise the hand function. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Mike Fisher. Yeah, I, I just want to pop on and and uh, echo what others have said. I appreciate, I really do appreciate the work. Um, and uh, appreciate the great discussion last week and look forward to working on this more with you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, if there's no other comment, we can turn to Michelle Sawyer for the ACO budget. Oh, sorry, um, A. Berman's hand is up, Mr. Berman. Chair Foster, um, I don't want to interrupt Michelle's um, start here, but I just wonder if I could just give a quick op opening statement about the, the budget. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just want to say we're we're committed to pro providing the board with the information necessary to fulfill the regulatory obligations that you have in a transparent fashion. Um, you know, the it's a challenging process. I know with the competing priorities you have, but we submitted a budget in 2023 that we felt represented our plan for 24. And you know, we think of that as the target we plan on hitting. It's meant to be the guide that we use throughout the year to determine whether we're staying on track with our financial targets and help us identify where we need to take action to get back on track in the event of unexpected events. A lot of things can happen between the time we create that budget, when it gets approved, and the actual start of the performance period, which we're in May of now including just ordinary variation, revised estimates, staff turnover, et cetera. That said, the revised budget that we you know, um, sent in remains an appropriate reflection of our plan for 24. And our intention over the past few weeks has been to answer any additional questions that the staff communicated to us and to provide information as requested. That said, there are always practical constraints on what we can provide. And like the board, we struggle with limited resources and bandwidth. Um, we also have to comply with the contractual requirements in our payer and provider contracts. Um, you know, just close by saying the prevailing model and the standard for most organizations is to set a budget annually and then evaluate that 
regularly to see how the organization is performing throughout the year. Because no matter how comprehensive and complete budgeting is, things just don't go according to plan all the time. Regularly analyzing the variance between the budget and the actual performance is something that we've historically reported the board through our quarterly financial statements and that we have every intention of continuing to do so throughout the year. And I truly feel like that's the best way to reflect changes in what actually happens versus what we planned on happening. So I just wanted to preface everything with that to say that, you know, we we're really committed to looking at that budget regularly and seeing how it plays out throughout the performance period. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Sawyer. Okay, thank you. So we're here today to look at OneCare's uh, FY24 revised budget. Um, I'm joined by our staff attorney, Mark Hengsler, and Matthew Sutter, our Deputy Director of Health Systems Finance. Here's a quick timeline. Um, the light blue squares up top are for the initial budget process that started last fall. Um, we now found us in the revised budget process. Uh, they submitted their revised budget to us on April 2nd. Um, One Care came in for their hearing on the 17th, and we are here today um, for our staff presentation. So the revised budget process was started a few years ago when One Care started submitting their budgets to the Green Mountain Care Board. And due to timing, the initial budget submission um, was apologies the initial sub uh, budget submission in the fall was based on attribution estimates and unfinalized payer contracts making it necessary for the aco to resubmit their budget when these particular items were finalized the revised budget also gives the board an update on compliance with any pertinent budget order conditions that may have been issued into response um, to their initial budget the staff have used the revised budget amounts to complete analyses of how One Care budgets year over year, helps to inform budget targets that might appear in guidance, and it helps the staff to determine compliance with budget targets. So this language on this slide and the next few slides are is pulled directly from budget order condition number nine in the FY24 budget order. One Care must submit a revised budget that includes all of the following items. A, final payer contracts, B, attribution by payer, C, a revised budget used, uh, using a template provided by GMCB staff, and D, final description of OneCare's population health initiatives, including final care coordination. C has a red X next to it because of a lack of um, a submission um, regarding the, how they um, budget their administrative budget by function or program, which was part of the workbook. Um, as well as a lack of an update in our adaptive software um, updating their budget for attribution. And there will be more on both of these subjects later. So E, hospital dues for 2024 by hospital, um, F, hospital risk for 2024 by hospital and payer, G, documentation of increasing the one care held risk in the amount ordered by the GMCB and any changes to the overall risk model for 2024, and H, source of funds for its 2024 population health management programs. Regarding G, while the submission in the workbook does suggest that One Care is in compliance with this budget order condition, the staff are awaiting the submission of One Care's updated settlement policy to reflect that One Care's internal operations have been aligned to comply with this risk arrangement. The policy was updated by their board of managers about three weeks ago, and as of yesterday, it's our understanding that that policy is still routing for signatures. I, um, revised benchmarking report uh, pursuant to condition one. J, a report on the board, uh, to the board on one care's progress relative to its targets for commercial payer FPP levels. K, a statement of how these funds uh, reduced from operating expenses were reallocated to population health and primary care programs. And finally, any other information the GMCB deems relevant to ensuring compliance with this order. This one is marked in yellow because it was uh, a bit of a mixed result. There was a narrative portion of the revised budget submission that was completed in full. However, there were some items linked to other budget order conditions that weren't submitted, which will be discussed later. 
Um, I'll also note that at the end of the slide deck, there is a chart that outlines the current status of each of OneCare's FY24 budget order conditions for reference. So before we get into the details about some of the issues staff have observed with the submission, um, Mark is going to walk us through some of the subsections of Rule 5 to orient us as to how the board monitors an ACO's performance under an established budget and how the board may respond if an ACO is not meeting the requirements of a budget order. Hey, thanks, Michelle. Um, so just a reminder, we are uh, here uh, pursuant to budget order conditions for the FY24 budget order, uh, condition nine required one care to submit materials for, uh, regarding revised budget. Condition 10 required it to present, uh, which is which is what happened previously. Um, the board's powers to really respond to those flow through uh, rule five at uh, 5.407 which states that the board may review an ACO's performance under an established budget at any time. So this is just the time that we that we chose. Um, under the rules, such review need not be limited to financial performance. The board may cover any matter approved as part of the budget, meaning may cover material under budget order conditions. Um, as the board has seen and done previously, you know, there can be a determination, which is really a, a financial or budgetary determination that the ACO's performance has varied substantially from its budget. Um, that's We've seen that in the past. Um, it can initiate a process for adjusting or revising the budget, which again is really a determination that there's a, a financial variance. But in addition to that, or as an alternative, the board may take any actions under Rule 5.407 to compel compliance with an established budget or compel compliance with budget order conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so with that in mind, you know, what any and all powers the board has, what, what are those powers? I'm just going to quickly go over those so we're all on the same page about what the board can do. Um, first, uh, condition, uh, or sorry, rule uh, 5.504, if the board finds that an ACO is failing to meet requirements of an order or of conditions of an order, the board may at its discretion take what's called remedial action in the rule. Um, there are There's no enumerated list of what all of the remedial actions could be. Uh, one example that's given in the rule is the requirement to uh, have the ACO present a corrective action plan. Uh, the idea of remedial action is that if there's a variance between what was required and what happened, the board might choose to take some action to try to get the ACO to remedy that issue and get back on track. Um, to this process has some, th there's some process behind this. So before requiring remedial action, the board must provide the ACO a written explanation of any deficiencies that it's identified. Uh, the ACO gets 30 days to respond, and then the board posts that response to its website, accepts public comment, and then can choose at its discretion to hold a public hearing to discuss further. Um, uh, either way, at that point, the board has the power to decide whether to take remedial action and the scope that, that it would take. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so while that's one mechanism that the board has uh, to uh, uh, deal with a um, a variance between what was submissed, what was submitted and what was required. The other one is not in rule, but in statute. So 18 VSA section 9381C uh, provides that if an appeal or other petition uh, for judicial review of a final order is not filed, uh, the chair of the board may file a certified copy of the final order with the clerk of a court of competent jurisdiction. Uh, the order has the same effect as a judgment of the court and can be recorded, enforced, or satisfied in the same manner as a judgment of the court. A simple way of boiling this down might be just stating that this is a, a different mechanism the board has to kind of get at the same idea, which is that it can uh, uh, use a process to uh, enforce a, a a budget order or budget order conditions to ensure compliance. Um, I think that's it for me, so I'll turn it back to you, Michelle. Thank you. I think I'm handing it over to Matt at this point. 
Thanks, Michelle. Um, we'll just very quickly just go look at a condensed income statement. Uh, here you can see the board ordered um, shift from operating expenses to population health management of 957,000. Um, apart from this change, however, the revised budget includes no other changes. Um, as Mr. Berman mentioned, um, this is inconsistent with prior years. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, in the past, one care has testified that the business model itself scales with attribution, um, total cost of care, the risk spending. Obviously, there's fixed costs, um, but in the past, we've we've understood that the that attribution does affect um, multiple areas of their budget. Um, they've submitted a letter this year saying that the attribution they're asserting that the updated attribution figures are not material to the budget and do not affect the overall budget or programs. Um, However, there's no way for staff to judge this um, materiality without knowing the attribution changes affect programs. Um, so back to you, Michelle. Thanks. So as we've discussed, the attribution um, affects the budget of an ACO, but it also impacts uh, how and how much risk is distributed throughout the network. So I wanna take a minute to go through that as we just received this information fairly recently. So um, here is how the amount of risk changed for the network between the initial and revised budget. Um, the overall risk levels, which is inclusive of one care as an entity, the downside risk increased from 42.1 million to 44.4 million. And um, similarly, the upside risk increased from 32.2 uh, million to 34.6 million. And the one, uh, one care held risk changed more significantly. The downside risk went from 1.84 million to the 7.93 million and upside risk from um, 961,000 to 7.07 million. Um, the one care held risk is mainly a function of the budget order condition. Um, so uh, ordering one care to hold um, additional risk this year. So the key takeaway um, is that the revised budget was not updated for attribution. Um, as Matt mentioned um, in, in a memo from One Care on Monday, they said that the updated attribution figures are not material. Um, and, and while this certainly could be true, um, it is also true that they were required to submit a budget based on the final attribution numbers. Um, and before Monday gave no explanation as to why they didn't comply with this budget order or ask for it to be waived. So the next topic is um, the administrative budget by function. The objective in collecting this information is to help the board and the ACO gain insight into what it costs them to run the ACO at the program and function level. This look at the administrative budget was recommended to the board by multiple consultants. Um, the reports are linked in this slide. The board and the, uh, the board and the staff have requested this information from the ACO multiple times in the past year. So the key takeaway um, is that the submission as far as the budget by function is concerned was not completed um, and there has been no indication of the ACO's um, willingness to comply with this in the future. And while not being able to provide prospective estimates of administrative expectas, uh, expenses in this way, um, might be understandable if ACO staff have never been directed to track their time by project. Um, the ACO has known for nearly a year that this request, um, this was a request of the board to be able to look at their administrative budget through this lens, and they could have worked to be able to provide this information in the future. Um, and like I said, they um, they have not done so, nor signaled uh, their willingness to do so in the future. So outside of the revised budget itself, um, I wanted to bring up the uh, budget order condition number seven, the verification on oath. So this oath required, or rather this condition required that one care um, verify that all primary care earned PHM funds are being used to support and enhance primary care services. You can see through the flowchart here that when hospital owned primary care um, earn, 
uh, money through their PHM program, the ACO sends those earnings to hospitals. And really what's a black box for the board, and it sounds like for the ACO, is whether those dollars are actually flowing back down to support primary care as is the intent. Um, and according to a memo from February, the One Care Board of Managers does not feel that directing hospitals to expend funds in this manner is necessary or advisable. So the key takeaway here is that the submission was not completed um, and there has been no indication of planning to comply in the future. So these are just a summary of the three kind of issues that um, the staff just wanted to alert the board to. The fact that the revised budget was not updated for attribution, um, the budget by function workbook was not completed, and the verifi verification on oath was not signed, and there have been, there's been no indication of um, uh, being willing to modify practices so they might be able to sign in the future. And then just briefly, um, here are some examples of some challenges with compliance we've had with the ACO over the last uh, year or so. Um, so in the FY23 budget order, um, Chair Foster wrote One Care a letter in February of 2023 um, informing the ACO that they were out of compliance uh, from their approved budget due to a lack of support for primary care. Um, and this was really due to the loss of the Blue Cross Blue Shield um, payer program for that year. Um, later on in the year, there were some challenges around getting um, information around executive compensation and how those were benchmarked against national standards. Um, because One Care was not willing to give us that information, the board issued a subpoena. Um, the subpoena was argued in court, and unfortunately, we have received um, that information at this point. Um, and lastly, the amended budget order. This is under appeal currently, um, but the board had ordered a cut to executive compensation as a whole to the 50th percentile of nationally benchmarked um, uh, compensation. And um, the board had ordered One Care to uh, seek the ho their hospital network to attest to how they are using primary care earned funds. I'm going to pass it back over to Mark to walk us through some of the options available to the board today. So a few options here. Um, starting point, I've written take no action. Really, you could think about this in a few ways, though. So there's the option to take no action and and find that these uh, uh, issues are, are not really worth uh, uh, taking effort to to correct or that there aren't you know there, there aren't concerns on the on the board's part with with these items uh, the other way of thinking about this is that we are approaching budget guidance for fy25 and we'll have a budget process uh, sooner than uh, sooner than we can imagine you know for for fy25 so one option would be to simply say well um, any issues that the board has here it could choose to try to deal with with um, uh, future budget order conditions um, uh, going forward um, the same just on that item I suppose is true of the fact that under this budget order, the board does have uh, the power to, uh, after notice and opportunity to be heard, make future orders uh, or further orders that are necessary to um, carry out the purposes of the FY24 budget order. Um, timing wise, I'm, I'm not really sure, you know, if one is better than the other, but, but that's an option available to the board. Basically say defer action for now is the way to think of item one. Item two, uh, the board could determine that One Care is failing to meet requirements of this budget order, which again is Rule 5.504. Um, if the board made a finding that One Care is failing to meet the requirements of the budget order, that would initiate a remedial action process where the board would write to One Care with an overview of deficiencies and uh, one care would have the opportunity to respond before any remedial action plan was was uh, was implemented. Um, 
that could lead to a corrective action plan. It could lead to other remedial measures like a monitoring plan or an auditing plan or examples that are in the rule. Again, the idea for this item, for this part of the rule is that remedial action is action that is designed to remedy um, uh, regulated entities failure to meet requirements of an order. Um, the third option is that the board could file this and or future budget orders with the court uh, as described at 18 VSA 9381C. Um, uh, and that would give the board powers of enforcement uh, as, as I described before. Um, staff do have some like template motion language prepared should the board want it. Um, that's just in the appendix section of the slides. It's not something that we'll present to the board now. Um, but with that, uh, I, I believe I can turn it back to you, Chair Foster, for um, further discussion. Thank you all. That was a helpful walkthrough. Um, Mr. Boris, do you have a public comment? Yes, please. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Hi, everyone. Tom Boris, CFO for One Care Vermont. Uh, just a couple comments here based on the presentation I'd like to address. First, starting on slide four, um, I disagree relative to the characterization of item C, uh, which is to submit the revised budget. We uh, submitted all the templates requested of us with our 2024 budget data. Sorry, can I can I can I interrupt for one second? C can we just go to? I want to follow along. Sure. Thing. Sure. Thing. Maybe just a little bit slower so I can make sure I catch it. Sure. Um, just disagree with this characterization, the red X there. We we submitted all the templates uh, provided to us with our 2024 budget information. The one tab that we've discussed previously that we're unable to populate was called budget by function and program. And we communicated before this process began. We, we just don't have that data uh, and do not have a reliable methodology to slice our operations into the 19 categories requested. Uh, this is a a timing challenge for me in the sense that this is a 2024 budget that will be based on some sort of historical basis that we just don't have. Moving forward, I'm open to discussing some segmentation. I think the 19 categories are far too granular for us to be able to do this, but for our 2024 budget process, it just represents data we do not have and cannot reliably submit. And remember, we submit all these uh, documents under oath, and I just wouldn't be able to feel a level of confidence that it accurately represents an appropriate segmentation of our work. So we made every effort to comply and submit this revised, uh, the revised documents, but that is the one exception that we discussed previously. Next on slide five, please. Um, just to note, we will absolutely get you that policy and have every intent of complying. I think the numbers that you saw about the change in the risk demonstrate our willingness to comply with that order. So just a timing issue there, but wanted to say it publicly here, we have every intent to comply with that budget order and have one care hold 1% of the downside risk from the Medicare program. Next, I'd like to speak about slide 12, please. Jump to that one, thank you. I really appreciate this slide actually, and it shows why we didn't need to seek a more um, in-depth and thorough budget approval from the One Care Board this year. So as the, the One Care business model is designed to scale with attribution as the quote articulates, there are nuances, however, related to which programs drove that attribution variance. So this year we had a 4% variation between the original uh, budget that we prepared and the attribution numbers that came in, which is quite small in my opinion, and they came from Medicaid and commercial programs. Both of these programs commit and contribute PMPMs to OneCare that we then use to, to fund the payments that go to providers. And it works largely in balance. A little bit higher revenue coming in, a little bit higher expense going out. Because of this dynamic, we evaluated the materiality of the change and didn't feel it was necessary to go back to the OneCare board and ask for an increase in participation fees. So because the, the materiality was low, we didn't need to do a full budget recast with our board and change the amount the hospitals contribute to our efforts. I also thought um, I'd add, there's the box in the bottom right, which says there's no way for the board to judge materiality without knowing how attributions changes affect programs. This is something that can be seen in our ordinary financial reporting each quarter. 
through that, we show here was here's the budget for something like PHM expenses. And then each quarter when we submit our actual expenditures, that difference can be evaluated and will help understand the difference between what we budgeted last summer and what we're experiencing in our actual operations throughout the course of the year. I'd also like to add some historical context here. Um, this is the most, 23 to 24 was the most consistent change or, or plan uh, that we've ever had. Pre-pandemic, we were growing aggressively uh, in the pursuit of scale years. And then through the pandemic period, we had a number of changes to programs and operations just reflecting those uncertain times. We changed risk corridors, we scaled back operations, cut initiatives that we had planned. And, and, all, and then in 23, as you know, we, we lost uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield as a contracted payer, significant change. 23 to 24 um, was the most consistent transitional fiscal year change that we've ever had. And the changes were very immaterial, in my opinion. And that is also why we did not go back to the One Care Board seeking a change to participation fees or any program dynamics or, or overall structure. So just thought that context was helpful to really say this is a consistent model, consistent operations from one year to the next. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perry, Aaron Perry. Uh, hi, uh, Aaron Perry, legal counsel for One Care Vermont. I have got uh, two points I'd like to raise. The first is slide 14 uh, related to the attestation. Uh, as the board knows, uh, we do currently have on appeal undecided yet the issue of the attestation that the board ordered that we receive from hospitals. Uh, with regard to an attestation that was in this year's budget order to be signed by uh, CEO or leadership of One Care Vermont, um, we would assert that the PHM payments that we make to hospitals are compliant with the APM, our contracts, and all regulatory requirements. And One Care, in fact, does not have regulatory authority over hospitals or the ability to require hospitals to distribute or expend funds in a particular manner. So we wanted that on record. Uh, the next, and I don't know what slide it is, but it's the slide around historical noncompliance. I believe the two issues raised on there are the um, uh, exec, uh, well, the, the support for primary care budget order, uh, which is on appeal, and the executive compensation cut, which is also on appeal. Characterizing these as non-compliant, I think, is a, a gross mischaracterization. These were issues that we had a legitimate legal concern and controversy around, and we availed ourselves of due process, which is contemplated in Rule 5, that we could appeal budget orders to the Vermont Supreme Court, which we have done. So characterizing these as non-compliance is, we believe, uh, a mischaracterization. Thank you. Thank you. While we're on the slide, I think there's also um, we're missing one. We actually had a board hearing, I think, on that fiscal year 23 support for primary care after Blue Cross. I think we had our letter and then we had a board hearing and then we had a board order mandating the payments be made. Um, in terms of whether or not these are non compliant with regard to the one subject to ongoing Supreme Court review. I would think that it actually is non compliant. If I think about like a trial court level decision. If you don't comply, you don't comply, but it's subject to appeal. It's not it's not a non compliant. It's a it's has a force of law. So if you comply with it or not, it's non compliant. It's just subject to appeal. But I think the point about the appeal is important and is accurate. Um, I'll open up to board. Comments and questions, which we usually do before public comment, but if any board members have thoughts, please go ahead. I have some questions for our legal counsel, which I think we'd need to do an executive session um, around the options. Um, so I think it probably makes sense for me to hold that uh, until people have more discussion. Um, but I just, I did have just a couple of things that I wanted to say substantively. Um, so when I looked at the revised budget work group workbook submission, which has the updated attribution, uh, the 
the FPP targets table, which is the second tab, includes both the expected total cost of care as well as uh, the new attribution, which I found helpful. And I'll just say for me personally, did help me assess the materiality of the change of 8,693 people in attribution across all programs uh, from 201,278 to 209. 971. Um, I don't actually find that a material change and I don't. So it doesn't bother me to not get uh, all everything updated based on such a small attribution change. I think that originally it was really necessary to get that because there were such wide swings and changes year over year. And quite frankly, uh, the board staff had indications from Medicare of their as attribution estimates, and they were way different than the ACO's budget submission. So it made sense to me to do that process um, annually so that because it felt to me like the information we were getting in the budget was not necessarily reliable, not and I don't mean that in a judgmental way, it's just it was difficult to project. And so it was important for us to get the accurate information. The original budget submission numbers look uh, pretty close to me, so I don't personally feel like I need um, the complete resubmission based on an update of 8,700 people. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there is that I think we do have some information on the materiality of the budget in the submission. Um, I think that question I should ask is really a legal question. Um, in terms of the uh, the budget by purpose, I think that what I I I think that if I understand the difficulty in potentially producing that retrospectively. I do think it could be helpful information moving forward as we think about uh, transitioning. In 2026, um, potentially, I would assume to a Medicare shared savings program. I don't know how the ACO programs might change as a result of that change in Medicare participation or what the other payer programs might be. But I think having an understanding of the connection between functional areas and costs is helpful um, in thinking through that transition. Um, I Certainly, I haven't looked at the categories, so I don't want to opine on the number of categories because um, I don't have an opinion on that yet. But I would be comfortable um, clarifying that as an expectation for 2025 in whatever way makes sense. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, on the third issue, um, I can see like this is information that we've been asking for for a while. I can see both sides of of what, you know, certainly why we're asking for it and why it's difficult to do in an attestation. So I'm I'd like to see if we could explore another approach to accomplish that, understanding that it's on appeal. So I don't know if that's an appropriate action at this time necessarily, but I'm certainly interested in exploring how to get the information. Um, and clarity moving forward. So I thought I'd just throw that my thoughts out there. And then I, once, when you think it's appropriate, Chair Foster, let me know and I'll move for executive session for legal advice. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead. I. I don't think I would support um, filing the order with the court at this time. Um, they do have a force of law. It was not appealed when we when we made the budget order and the budget order was made for good reasons. So it's a binding budget order. Nonetheless, I think that would be a little bit unnecessary in this context. Um, I don't support taking no action. This isn't a first time we've had an issue with compliance with budget orders. They're not voluntary. Regulated entities don't have the options of picking and choosing which ones they like or making materiality determinations. 
Our staff determined it was material. Our staff has reasons why they need it. And so I support the second option, which was to make a finding of noncompliance. Um, it could have been discussed earlier. It could have been uh, raised earlier to have an issue with these additional requirements. I think the budget by function one is really important, and I'll, I'll say why, which is I think not having that infringes on the board's ability to do its job. If we were to make a reduction, I think there would be a concern from the ACO as to why you made a reduction there or um, you know, why that amount. So I think having the budget by function allows the ACO to analyze what's working and what's not and where the money should best be spent. And so I think that that really infringes on our ability to do our job. Um, and as to the materiality, um, it does allow us to do the year over year analysis and it should have been discussed with the staff and you could have gotten agreement that way. It's not to pick and choose which ones from the regulated entities perspective. So that said, I also would just say that the budget by function and the primary care, these actually help the ACO. These help the ACO decide where to invest its money and resources to have the best achievement. And then the primary care one in particular, that's something we've all been trying to address for years. And it's a crux of the program and a crux of the ACO's intent. And we know that the ACO's performance on primary care quality measures is not where we want it. So understanding whether or not the money is going to its intent just seems really fundamentally important and should be in alignment with the ACO's objectives. I know maybe the hospitals don't want to give it, but maybe that's a conversation we can have. But I think it's important to do the job well. So in any event, I would support the second option for those reasons. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're a little out of order here with an opening statement and public comment kind of in the middle. So we'll just do the board part and then we'll go to public comment. I appreciate um, hearing the other board members' perspectives, and I actually would appreciate hearing the uh, legal advice questions in executive session. Michelle, a question for you. Um, I think you've, you've answered this, but I want to uh, make sure that I heard correctly. Do you feel that the staff needs the data, the budget data that's been requested, um, but not submitted to complete your work, our work as a regulator? We typically use the revised budget numbers to compare year over year. Um, and to not have that just for one year seems very inconsistent. So just having a consistent pattern of we receive an initial budget and a revised budget based on updated attribution numbers. That consistency, I believe, is important for staff to continue to analyze how one care budgets. Okay, and the quarterly reporting that um, is submitted it does not substitute for the revised budget in that context. Not in this context, no. Okay, um, and maybe this would happen in a in a uh, an executive session. So, but I would I would value a legal opinion on whether our our legal counsel. Um, it would just, agree. just I wouldn't. Yeah. You shouldn't ask legal questions publicly. Okay, to, then I a, won't. The question itself is privileged. Okay, thank you. Then I have no other questions. Sorry. No, that's great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm also um, not okay with not taking action. Um, I need to learn more about the similarities and differences between the, the uh, other two options presented to us. Um, from um, my perspective, as a board, we've ordered three things that have not been submitted in the way that we requested. Um, and in some response, we've been informed that it's just not the way that the regulated entity chooses to do things. And to my reading as a, not a lawyer, um, that is non-compliance. That if, you're, if there's an order 
saying why you didn't do it as ordered is not compliance. So um, I'm not OK doing nothing. Um, I'd like to learn more about our remaining options. Uh, but I believe something must be done. I think, Robin, if you want to make a motion for executive session to get legal counsel, that would be fine. Uh, I move that the board move into executive session uh, in order to get asked legal questions and get legal advice. Relating to this matter. Okay. I, I think that. Oh, Mike, go ahead. Uh, this is one of the, the bases that requires a finding um, that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body <clears throat> at a substantial disadvantage. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so cool. let me amend my motion uh, and turn it into two motions. So I <laughs> move that the board finds that uh, premature public knowledge of legal advice to the board relating to uh, the ACO budget and potential non-compliance. Um, I said that in the right order, that the, uh, that, uh, the board find that public, let me start over. I move that the board find that um, premature public knowledge of legal advice relating to the ACO budget uh, order in front of the board would uh, prejudice uh, the board. A second. All in favor, say aye. 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 And my apologies Hi. for not having this in front of me, so it's not rolling off the tongue. So my second motion will be uh, to move that the board go into executive session to receive legal advice relating to this matter. A second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, the motion carries. I think we can leave this meeting and go to the other one, and uh, then we'll come back. Thank you. Yes, and I wonder if you could do it yourself, Mr. Chairman. I would be encouraged by that. Could you just describe what the, the, the situation with the courts? There's a suit in process now, okay? And, and I'm just, it's hard, very difficult to get a grip on what that is. I'm not even dead sure what court it's in. I assume it's the Vermont Supreme Court. But in any event, could you just, I know you can't say anything about the merits, but I just wonder if you'd say, okay, the what what is what is actually the court deciding? And number two, a follow up sort of follow up question: If you're if it's legal for you to say that, what is the um, what will what will that to what extent will that the court decision drive the decisions that you're trying to reach now? Um, I, I can do my best to address the first part. The second one's a little tricky, but I'm, I'm happy to try and um, address the first. And I think we have, I think Mr. Perry's counsel and there's other lawyers on here. Um, I'm not a lawyer on this matter, but um, uh, in the summer of 23, the care board decided that the um, compensation for a set of executives at one care should be capped at the 50th percentile of the benchmarks that they use as a group. So um, that effect, that order went into effect, I think in August or so, and then one care appealed, as I understand it, on the basis of um, notice and the authority, some of the procedural issues around that and the board's authority. And um, there is a second issue that's under appeal, which related to the board required one care to have an attestation relating to how those primary care funds were being used at hospitals. And I think one care appealed that one as well. Um, and it is before the Vermont Supreme Court. Uh, it has been argued. Um, and so the matter is uh, pending before the five justices. 
Um, and then your second question, I don't think I could answer. Um, it really probably depends on what the court's judgments are. Uh, thank you, uh, sir. Thank you very much. Of course, Mr. Boris. Again, uh, thank you. Um, just a couple of comments uh, related to some of the previous uh, board questions. I, I thought I'd take a moment to address. Um, uh, one is relative to the question from uh, board member Holmes. Um, I just have a different opinion. I, I believe that uh, receiving the actual expenditures and the quarterly reports that we submit uh, regularly throughout the year will give the Green Mountain Care Board uh, every ability to evaluate the financial uh, results relative to the budget orders. I'm sorry, Michelle, to be contrary on that, but I just uh, view it a little bit differently. So I uh, wanted to voice that one. Um, another is it was suggested that having the budget by uh, function as presented in the budget uh, guide or documents would help uh, one care. And I have a different perspective on that as well. I understand the spirit uh, that we're, you're coming from, but every hour uh, one care staff spend counting widgets uh, and really going down these administrative rabbit holes comes at the expense of work that they could be doing under our contracts and to fulfill our, our purpose and mission. And we spend uh, an inordinate amount of time on uh, the regulatory work and any ability to redirect some of that time, I know you have obligations to fulfill, redirect that time back to working with our provider network in spirit of the goals that we share, I think is a really good thing. And in, in my personal opinion, I don't believe that uh, extremely granular time tracking is a good use of the time and resources that we have and the, and the staff and what they really sh should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Last comment is about budget order nine. Um, One care submitted a revised budget, period. I think what we are stuck on is judgments as to whether or not certain numbers warranted a change. And I've been budgeting for much of my professional career, creating operating budgets, year-end projections. Sometimes line items warrant a change and sometimes they don't. We exercised our judgment as management, had conversations with our board, and determined that the changes that we know about now through the passage of time didn't warrant changes to certain line items in our revised budget. That doesn't mean we did not submit it. And had we not had the budget orders requiring the shift in admin expense to population health management expenses, it's entirely plausible the revised budget would have been exactly the same as the budget submitted initially last fall. So I want to make that distinction between submission of a revised budget and an expectation of which numbers change. That's a judgment call or a judgment decision. And our board uh, voted to endorse the, the budget that we submitted uh, earlier this year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Um, I have uh, a couple motions, um, unless there's any other board comment at this time. Great. So first, I move that the board consider a revision to the fiscal year 24 budget requiring one care to prospectively include in its contracts with hospital providers a method for tracking population health payments to ensure those payments strengthen the provision of primary care. A second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries, and, and just for people um, following along, this is, the motion that I made was to consider a revision to the fiscal year 24 budget. It's not actually a revision to the budget. It's for the board to go forward with considering um, how to revise the budget to add an order relating to that provision. Uh, second, I move that the board consider a revision to the fiscal year 24 budget order requiring one care to prospectively implement a method of reporting its administrative and operational expenses by function 
such that one care and the board can sufficiently identify the administrative and operational expenses of various one care programs. Such a revision will require one care to describe and implement a process for tracking the benefit of each program for Vermonters. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. And the third motion I have relates to um, condition 10 B from the fiscal year 24 budget order. And I move that the board hereby determine that one care has failed to meet condition 10 B of the fiscal year 24 budget order, requiring a revised budget based on final attribution. The board shall provide one care with a written explanation of the deficiencies it has identified along with supporting data. One care shall respond to the board's explanation and any proposal for remedial action in the manner and time frame required pursuant to GMCB rule 5, section 5.504. All those in favor say aye. 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 I'm going to abstain. And the motion carries. Um, I would ask for public comment as well if there is any on um, the motions. Mr. Berman. Hey, Berman, CEO, One Care Vermont. Can you explain what 10B specifically is, Chair Foster? That was the um, revised budget based on the revised attribution. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. The purpose of the budgetary approval <laughs> is really to determine if an organization, and this is my perspective, so I'm not telling you what to do, to determine if an organization has appropriately allocated its resources to accomplish its mission. By that, I mean, did we use the money appropriately to get things done that we said we were going to get done in accordance with the contracts and the agreements? The level of micro interference that the board is seeking to engage in is not productive. And it's unclear what is in that motion to the benefit of Vermonters, what that means. Which Vermonters are you talking about? Uh, I, I just find this whole process to be extraordinarily um, focused on a level of procedural value and not actual value to Vermonters. So I'd ask you to really think carefully about how you proceed here and say, does this really end up helping provide better care to Vermonters? And I just don't think that's the case. That's my opinion, and I'm voicing it as a member of the public. Thank you for sharing your opinion. Is there any other public comment? Uh, Ms. Gutman? My observation is that I understand you don't want more work and work is expensive to do and you want to focus on the purpose of the work. But what I hear in the discussions and questions and so forth has to do with the fact that one care has not been achieving the goals that it ever had before it. So I see it necessary to understand why. And you can't understand why without information and data that that I guess the board is asking for. That's my observation. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Um, Mr. Berman, I see your hands up again. Just like to believe, briefly respond. We have provided sure. reams of information. 
against objective criteria of our performance. The idea that we somehow have not done that or not provided some piece of information that is the linchpin to deciding whether we've been successful or not, which is completely arbitrary, Ms. Goodwin, is just wildly inaccurate. And the amount of time and bandwidth that it is consumed by this process does not generate better outcomes, period. That is all. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else? Mr. Boris? I'd like to ask the board to define final attribution for me, please. Um, Ms. Sawyer, I think that's probably more your domain of exactly what you need. Sure. Um, so we do have a tab in the workbook that asks for an updated starting attribution and a final at or let me see what the term is exactly. Give me one moment, please. And Ms. Sawyer, if you want, we can just you can just look it up and then email them the definition because okay. we're running a little bit over time today and we can just send it to them. I can I can maybe help with a quick answer. Sure. Um I would define it as finalized contracts as of January 1. So contracts at the time of budget submission were not finalized then they're finalized. So what is your starting attribution for January 1 based on finalized contracts? Mr. Boris, do you have another comment? I do, thanks. Well, I posit that attribution is not final until the conclusion of the performance year and settlement occurs with the payers. There is a process that the payers go through that determines at the end of the year how many attributed lives on a member month basis we have. That process exclu includes exclusions. You're familiar with the QEM process in Medicare, I'm sure. So final attribution will not be known until settlement occurs far, about a year from now, year plus from now. So it is an impossibility for us to say here's final attribution and here's what our budget is based on that number today. My point is attribution is a living, breathing thing. We get an initial number before the performance year begins. And throughout the course of the year, there is attrition. People pass away, become unattributed for a number of different reasons. So asking us to build a budget based on final attribution is an impossibility. Sounds like probably more of a staff level discussion uh, rather than a board discussion, but if there's um, ways you've done it in the past that you want to discuss with staff is how you did it pre previously, that seems to make sense to me, so that's consistent. Sure. And to say it briefly, it, it is and will be an estimate. It's an estimate in our budget, and it's going to be an estimate throughout the course of the year. So. Any other public comment? One final thought, Chair Foster, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, there was an assertion made that we did not communicate in advance what we were going to submit and that we have not been forthcoming in answering questions. So when the suggestion is that it's a matter between us and staff to determine what final attribution means, it's challenging because my staff was in active communication with the staff of the board to answer any questions that they had. Um, and we remain in active con contact with them. Um, but to have that characterized later that we did not answer questions or were not forthcoming or did not telegraph what we were going to present is challenging. So I, I think it's important that Mr. Boris brings up the definition of something like final attribution because that word is powerful and is in your language of your motion. So we need to define that really carefully because as Mr. Boris says, 
the way these contracts work, we don't actually get that final attribution until the end of the performance year. So it's really important that we get the details right in these matters. How did you define it in the past? I don't believe we have. We don't, so in prior we don't years, use the definition of final attribution. We, we have attribution at the each quarter as we update. Mr. Boris could comment on that more than I could. Well, on that, I'll just say this process is the same. Where we estimate and evaluate attribution in prior years. There are much more substantive changes to our business model from one fiscal year to the next. And you know, per discussions earlier, this was a very seamless and smooth year, so we didn't feel a change was warranted. I'd like to add one more comment, which is to say the budget isn't really what matters. I know it's the focus of the regulatory process, but we can go in these circles around the budget endlessly, and it won't change how much this costs, and it won't change the impact on the, the providers that we serve. What really matters are actual operations how things unfold throughout the course of the year, and we're stuck in a swirl about a budget that really has no bearing on cost, quality, or healthcare outcomes other than the essence of it, which is the plan that we endeavor to execute throughout the course of the year. And I strongly encourage this board to evaluate the budget through that lens. This is our plan, plan of our board and our provider network there have not been substantive changes to that plan between the initial submission last fall and the submission that we supplied earlier in this calendar year. Anything else? Okay, is there any old business or new business for the board? And I will move to adjourn. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you, and we are adjourned.